there's more than one reason to love him, Connie. I think mostly because she sang so good, and I, I can't remember anything she ever recorded that I didn't love. I've admired her sincerity and her spirit and her commitment to traditional country music. And if you're talking about a country singer, they just ain't no better. And I really feel that. On behalf of the CMA, I now pronounce you, Connie, a member of the country music. All of that. Smith, as someone who doesn't know about country music, how would you describe it? I've always thought country music was the cry of the heart. You're leaving the heart that you're breaking Because you don't love me anymore What makes this project special to me is it's Connie Smith's 54th album. That's a lot of music. And that is a lot of music that has navigated all the trends that have come and gone, people that have come and gone. Not a whole lot's the same in the industry anymore that was there when Connie first started in 1964. But she's kind of one of those timeless figures. I love the fact that it is pure, it is authentic. You don't hear these kind of records coming out of Nashville very much anymore. And the fact that one of our greatest singers has given us some new songs to listen to is absolutely wonderful. But in truth, what makes this record most special is these songs, in a sense, tell the story of Connie Smith's life. You don't love me. How did this record come about? Well, it started on the floor of a television show. We did 156 episodes of called The Marty Stewart Show, which celebrated traditional country music. We were on the floor uh, of this one show, and Connie had chosen a song called A Million and One that Billy Walker had recorded years ago. And as we were performing the song, I thought, this is not just a television performance. This is a record. We had Pig Robbins on piano, the Superlatives and Gary Carter, Chris Wilkinson's string section was there. It just sounded like one of those old A-team records from Studio B. So I went by the control room at the end and I said, can I have a copy of that? And I took it home and listened to it and went, that is a record. It's the beginning of a record. How many teardrops have I cried over you? A million and one tears A million and two How many long nights Have my arms ached for you A million and one nights a million and two. And it happened again with a song, very same circumstances, called All the Time. And both of those songs were the first two records that I kept for a long time to get this record started.
Well, most people call me Connie. I was born August the 14th in 1941. My daddy's name was Alan Holbert Metter. My mama's name was Wilma Lotus Lily. Isn't that pretty? My stepfather's name was Thomas Wesley Clark. Mama named me Constance June Metter because she saw an article in the paper that mentioned Constance Bennett, the actress, and she liked the name Constance. I was born in Elkhart, Indiana, but when I was five months old, my family took a train back to Hinton, West Virginia, where my daddy was from. There were 14 kids. We had an old battery radio at our house, and we would listen to it anytime we could get the Grand Ole Opry, because it was pretty staticky at times. I always said, someday I'm gonna sing on the Grand Ole Opry, but I never really thought I would. My very favorite singers back when I was younger was the Leuven Brothers, and I loved Kitty Wells. Just about the time I got out of high school, there was a fellow in our community named Floyd Miller that started a band, and he asked me if I would sing with him. And so I sang with that little band for a while, but I got fired. <laughs> Two of my all-time favorite Recordings of Connie's, uh, actually not of her records, but of home recordings that have surfaced. One is a local radio show, country music radio show from her area in Ohio when she was just a young lady. The band leader introduced her to come up to the microphone and sing, and when he did, she laid into it and took care of business. It was awesome. Howdy, friends, and hello, neighbors. It's country music time. Thanks a lot, Mr. Now we're going to bring Connie back up the microphone. She's got another ready for us this time entitled Daddy Call Boogie. Well, down in Louisiana where the bright sun shines, they do the boogie woogie nearly all the time. They do the Daddy Call Boogie. Yeah, the Daddy Call Boogie. Well, the Daddy Call Boogie makes you boogie woogie all the time. The other one that means a lot to me came to our house on a little reel to reel tape and it's her sitting at her kitchen table up in Warner, Ohio, way before Nashville ever called her, just heard her guitar singing her songs and you can see into her heart and you can see into the depth of that voice and it absolutely tells you that she was great from the beginning. There goes my reason for living There goes the one of my dreams There goes my only possession There goes my everything We see that nowadays everyone, a lot of musicians are found through viral videos or social media. How would you describe your beginnings? Well, I actually sang anytime I got a chance at a, at a PTA meeting or a Grange meeting. Uh, and there also was a, were a lot of country music parks uh, around where I lived. And we went, heard about one near Columbus, Ohio, called Frontier Ranch, and that's where I got my start. Frontier Ranch was just one of many of those kind of country music parks. Uh, Sunset Park was one, it was one of the most famous, and it was in Pennsylvania. And uh, Buck Lake Ranch was very famous. Uh, Mockingbird Park was famous. Ponderosa Park in Salem, Ohio, I went there a lot. And what made these parks so special is they were wonderful for the people that came to entertain and also for the fans. It was like a great big family. Everybody got to know everybody else and everybody ate together and it was fun. Those parks featured uh, artists like Buck Owens and the Buckaroos had Loretta Lynn, the Stonemans, which were an awesome family group that just would keep everybody on the edge of their seat. They were so energetic and so cute and so talented that they were one of the, I think, the favorites of any of the parks. And of course, then they have the awesome ones like Johnny Cash. And uh, there was Ray Price, uh, the Maddox Brothers and Rose. It was like going to another planet to get to go see them. The way I wound up on stage at Frontier Ranch was my husband Jerry and I went up there thinking we were gonna see George Jones. They had told us the wrong week, and he'd been there the week before. So I didn't get to see George. But while we were there, we found out they had a talent show every week. 
So my husband and some friends talked me into entering the talent contest. But I was hesitant because I had to play my own accompaniment and I could only play the guitar in the key of C. But I entered and I sang a Gene Shepherd song called I Thought of You and I won. I won five silver dollars and the opportunity to sing on the Grand Ole Opry show that night. The Opry star that week was somebody I'd never heard of at that time, a guy named Bill Anderson. And the song I sang on his show was a Jim Reeves song called Four Walls. But I did finally get to see George Jones at Frontier Ranch. After I went to Nashville and my record hit, I was invited back to be on a show at Frontier Ranch with George Jones. Singing at Frontier Ranch that Sunday was something I didn't expect to do and was talked into doing, and I was scared to death, but I got it done, and I was glad when it was over with. It was really something, but I never thought I'd ever do it again. I just went back home and took care of the house and the baby and all of that. About six months later, we went to see the Hank Williams Memorial Show up in Canton, Ohio, and they had Johnny Cash, June Carter. Also on that same show was Bill Anderson. And so after it was over with, I wanted to get June Carter's and Johnny Cash's autograph. So we went in the autograph line and uh, Bill Anderson saw us and recognized my husband and I and invited us to come backstage. And he was talking with us and he said, would you like to go to eat with uh, the band and I, you know, after the show? And so we did. And he said, you like the music so well, why don't you just come to Nashville? <laughs> like you could just come to Nashville. And he said, no, really, I'm supposed to host the Ernest Tubb Record Shop in March. And he said, I'd like for you to be my guest. So we planned on that, and I came down on March the 28th, 1964. Going to the record shop, I got to uh, meet Ernest Tubb. But when I got finished singing, this guy come up and said, my wife wants to meet you. She's back here. Would you come back here? And I said, yeah. So I went back there and it was Du was the guy and he was Loretta Lynn's husband. So he took me back there and I got to meet Loretta. And Loretta said, I want to talk to you. Said, uh, you got what it takes. You're going to make it. And I want to do for you what Patsy Cline did for me when I came to town. So she proceeded to give me some advice. In May, Bill called me and said, I've got some songs I wrote. Uh, would you demo them for me? So I came down and uh, demoed three songs. And so I did the demo on those and went back home. Bill Anderson's manager, he took the tape to Chet Atkins. Chet wanted to sign me. So that was in uh, May. I went down on June the 24th and signed a recording contract with RCA Victor. I recorded my very first record on July the 16th, 1964. Once a day, Once a day. All, day long. all day long, and once a night, once a night. from dusk till dawn. Here's a young lady that I think you folks will enjoy. She comes from Warner, Ohio, and singing a fine song called I Can Stand It As Long As He Can. Let's have a nice welcome for Miss Connie Smith. That always has a fine song lined out. One of the singingest little packages you ever saw in your life. Miss Connie Smith, how about a nice hand for her? Sarla 
like to call a little girl out that I think everybody here tonight knows and recognizes by a number one hit record, little Connie Smith. She's going to help me. Yeah. <laughs> Riding down the road with a good old buddy of mine, old Max Sanders. He owns a radio station there in Omaha. And uh, we were listening to his station, and a young lady came on. And I said, Stop calling that fine. Who is he? He said, I don't know. And so we checked around and found out it was a young lady named Connie Smith. And since then, the record had just gone zoom. And uh, it's a big record in the country field. Now it's broke over in the pop charts. And we'd like you to give a nice warm welcome to a young lady who's making her first network television debut. Here she is, Connie Smith. When you found somebody new, I thought I never would forget you for I thought then. Once a day, it sold 100,000, and it went to number one, and was number one for eight weeks. We just thought, well, we might give it a shot. So I packed up Darren and went down to Nashville, moved in April of 65. We came to Nashville driving in a red Ford Galaxy convertible with a white top, and we were driving through the mountains, and all of a sudden, on the radio, I heard them playing my record, which I had never heard on the radio before, and that was my big goal. So I was trying to listen, and the radio station started fading out. <laughs> And I was so excited, I had rolled down the window and I halfway climbed out of the window so I could pull up the antenna so we could listen to it. And that was my goal, really. I just wanted to hear myself on the radio one time. I wasn't ready for stardom. I didn't want it. I didn't aim for it. I just wanted to sing. Well, all of a sudden, I found myself doing personal appearances uh, because of the records I started making and signing autographs. And, and even not too long after I got to Nashville, I wound up being in some of the country music movies that were playing at that time. And the one that I think uh, everybody ought to see and watch the very beginning because it starts out with me driving in a Lincoln Continental convertible pulling up to the airport to pick up Doodles Weaver. Pardon me, sir, but are you Colonel Fiedelbaum? Oh, oh, yeah, I'm Colonel Fiedelbaum. Well, I'm Connie Smith. Connie Smith. And to be honest, it was my first time ever driving a car. I didn't even have a learner's permit. Have you decided to help me out with a talent for the show? Yes, but Mr. Grover promised me I could sing in the picture. Hey, Roy. Great privilege to present America's number one female country and western singer, the lovely and talented Miss Connie Smith. <laughs>
here is the Cinderella story of country music. Miss Connie Smith cut her first record, and it was a smasheroo. Here's Miss Connie Smith right now. Connie. <laughs> famous. She was a local housewife singing her songs on the weekends or to entertain herself up in Ohio. Stardom came calling and when it did it came fast and hard. The industry knew they had a precious treasure there so they encouraged her to go bigger, broader. I felt like I was on a roller coaster and it was going faster and faster and faster. And I can tell you this with full assurance, that Connie Smith is a devoted mama above all. Her children have great priority in her heart. Some photographs that I've always thought were interesting was her son Darren, her original baby. In the early days when Connie was becoming a star, there's photographs of Darren in the Cadillac with his little face sticking out, you know, on tour with mama. Darren backstage with mama. Darren sitting on the autograph table with mama. But the one that absolutely says it all is there's an outtake from one of Connie's album cover photo sessions. She's doing her first gospel music record and she's sitting there with the Bible, looking at the Bible. And the photographer, he pulled back and got a shot while Connie's looking like this. Darren's hanging on the stool below. But that says it all. My son Darren and I, we were a pair. He was my little friend and he was with me all the time. The first time I ever went out on the road, I had a 12-day tour. I found a wonderful lady, an older lady that uh, she was Darren's babysitter, and she was just precious, and I trusted her. But when I got back after 12 days, she told me that Darren had stood there and talked her into putting my record on the phonograph, and, he, and she would play the record, and he'd just look out the window waiting for me to come back, and I thought, that's it. I'm done. I don't want this. Go. Well, the truth of the matter is, if Connie was on her way to be crowned queen of the world, and one of the kids or the grandkids called and needed something, then queen of the world would just have to wait, and that's how it is. After I had my fifth baby, and I, and I had the three babies a year apart, the last three, every time I'd start to leave, one would get a fever, or one would skin its knee, or one would just be crying around my legs, not wanting me to go, and, and I just couldn't take it anymore. So something had to give. I quit to be with the family. Another bridge I burn. 
Murray Stewart produced this record with you. How did you start at working together? Well, several years ago, all my kids were gone. I was alone. I ended my third marriage. My daughter Jeannie called me and she's all excited about what she's going to do for the weekend. And all of a sudden she got real quiet, realizing I was there by myself. And she said, well, Mama, what are you going to do? And after I hung up from her, I got to thinking, well, what are you going to do? You know, you could get in the music business. Well, who would I work with now that knows who I am and how I feel about music, but also has a hand on what's happening today? And the only person that came to my mind was Marty Stewart. When I was growing up in Mississippi, we had a record called Miss Smith Goes to Nashville. I like listening to it. I like the sound of Connie's voice, and I love looking at her on the cover. She was so pretty. One of the highlights of those Mississippi days was Connie actually came to my hometown to sing at the Choctaw Indian Fair. And that was a big time at our house because Connie was my mom's favorite singer. My sister, my mom, and myself, we went out to the Choctaw Fairgrounds to listen to Miss Connie Smith sing. After the show, I got her autograph, got my picture made with her, and on the way home from that show, I told my mom I'm gonna marry Connie Smith someday. But after I came to Nashville, never really crossed paths with her much. I'd see her occasionally at the Grand Ole Opry. Years went by. Somehow, we wound up in a same space backstage at some event in Nashville in the early 1990s. It was the first time I'd ever really talked to her. And we had a wonderful, long conversation. Nobody bothered us, not one time. And at the end of the day, I remember thinking that was a cherished conversation. But one of the most astounding facts to come out of that conversation is Connie told me she hadn't made a record in 20 years, which was unthinkable to me. After I got to know her, and we did begin to work together, it was the songs we were writing that spoke to me. We'd write pretty words and I'd hear her sing them back to me. I suppose I was under a spell. We fell in love and got married. I quickly realized that my heart had finally found a home. It must have remembered way back when to those Mississippi days and I didn't have to run anymore. With Connie, it was the beginning of a lifelong love affair, as well as a lifelong musical partnership. We've written lots of songs, toured together, created a lot together, but it really means the world to me to be a part of making records with her. This record is entitled The Cry of the Heart. It's the third record I've produced for Connie, and it's extremely special. is unapologetically authentic traditional country music. Do you think that's still relevant and needed today? Yes, I do. Uh, it's relevant to me because I love it so much and I'd like to pass that on. I'm one of the teachers now and my desire is to keep traditional country music alive. You're breaking Cause you Don't love me Anymore That's good Way to go All right
is a world of love and admiration for Connie. And when she records the best of the best engineers, photographers, filmmakers, musicians, singers, and songwriters appear, everybody brings the best in their heart for her. And I do believe that everyone understands that in working with Connie, they're participating in a fresh chapter of country music history in the making. Connie's loyalty runs deep. On this project, she recorded her 72nd song written by Dallas Frazier. Dallas is Connie's writer. The two of them are truly musical soulmates. The other musical partnership here is Connie and Pig Robbins. Pig is one of the greatest musicians of all time. He's played on more hits than we could ever count. He played on Connie's first RCA Victor sessions in 1964. Her singing goes to an entirely different emotional level when Pig plays for her. I love the fact that the two of them are still making music together. They're like brother and sister. Pig and Connie were inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame on the same day. Isn't that something? Lot of love there. Yeah. Fabulous. Cool song. This world has never been in the awful shape it's in, and our leaders are in doubt of what to do. It's time a prayer was spoken from the heart of every man. Jesus, take a hold and lead us through. You are a person of faith, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. That's my greatest desire. Has that ever caused any problems with you because you share your faith? Well, yeah, a few times. The folks don't want to hear that. I guess the Grand Ole Opry got enough calls. I would always give a short testimony. So they told me I either had to quit doing that or I would have to leave the Opry. It's time a prayer was spoken from the heart of every man. Take a hold and lead us through. I chose to close this album with a song that Merle Haggard wrote in the late 1960s called Jesus Take a Hold and Lead Us Through, which I actually had first recorded in the early 1970s. He wrote it about the condition of our country at that time with the unrest and the riots and all that was going on. And I believe the song is just as relevant today as it was then and maybe even more so. Like the ancient Roman Empire, this world is doomed to fall. And it's much too big a thing for mortal man. Just take a look around and see the writing on the wall. Somehow we've got to find a helping hand. Merle was such a poet, he had a great eye for the future. He could see the big picture. Jesus, take a hold and lead us through. Jesus, take a hold and lead us through. Connie Smith is absolutely a profound heart of a person. It all comes from the heart. And she has inspired and encouraged so many people. She'll never know how many. And this record, The Cry of the Heart, is not just a milestone for her at this point in her life, but it's also a milestone for the culture of country music. Because traditional country music, it's not an abundance anymore. There's so little left of the real authentic thing at a quality level. And this is as good as it gets. And it proves that it is alive and well and continues on and on.
that my arms ache for you A million and one nights A million and two A million and two A million and one dreams A million and two There's people picking on the Opry And I don't know who they're with There's too much boogie-woogie, not enough Connie Smith. 